Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Michael Thurman, the CEO of DeKalb County, Georgia, and I would like to welcome uh, you to the second meeting of the DeKalb COVID uh, Strategic Task Force. I'd also like to once again express my appreciation to the outstanding citizens and public servants who are present on this call today, who volunteered their time and their energy and their talents uh, to help uh, shape policy at the local level to help us respond to this unprecedented uh, health and economic crisis, uh, this pandemic that has been the result of a virus that has spread literally across the entire planet. I have been encouraged and, and deeply appreciative of your support and your counsel, your advice, and your prayers. Uh, I've stated on multiple occasions, and I think it's appropriate to state it once again, that the challenge, of course, is unprecedented, but uh, together, there are no challenges we will not and cannot overcome. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, task Force members, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Uh, I have heard from really not just across DeKalb County, but I received communications really from around the country of individuals who have been impressed uh, by not only the collection of talent that we have, but the ability of men and women here in DeKalb County to come together across partisan and racial and geographic lines, uh, religious and ethnic lines, to come together, to work together, to solve this crisis. Uh, one, and I'll share this, and I, I'm sure they don't mind, we received multiple conversations and have had an ongoing uh, relationship with another jurisdiction that is forming a similar task force and that is Prince George's County, Maryland. They have followed, they, they, they are tuned in today, I would suspect, and they've looked at the videos and we've shared with them background information. And uh, the county executive there, Ms. Angela Alsobrooks, is in the process of establishing a task force similar to ours. So we're making a difference in the cab and literally all across this nation. So thank you so much. I'm proud to announce that we have three new task force members uh, joining us today. But before I introduce the task force members, I know that uh, one of the cabs uh, most uh, distinguished jurors is also uh, participating and on the line today. And the Honorable Judge Al Judge Wong, where Judge Wong is here. And thank you so much, Judge, for being with us. And I want to personally thank Judge Al Wong for his friendship and encouragement, not just during this crisis, uh, but throughout my residency here in DeKalb County, Georgia. Thank you so much. And let me move quickly to our new members and members, we can welcome them. And if either one would like to have a word, please feel free to do so. Uh, I mentioned Judge Wong, but you know there is actually a person of even more stellar accomplishment in that household. And that's his lovely wife, uh, Ms. Jeannie. Lynn is with us and she's accepted. Thank you so much, Ms. Jean, for being with us. I second that motion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also a distinguished uh, public servant uh, who has worked tirelessly in the Clarkson area uh, with citizens of all nationalities and races and creeds and colors uh, to ensure that citizens who come to DeKalb County literally come to America in search of fulfilling uh, the American dream. Uh, Ms. Samia Abdullah is here. Uh, Samia, she is a wonderful, wonderful servant. I met her during my tenure as superintendent of the Cab County School. She is an amazing person and she has made contributions in the Cab and all across the face of our earth. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. And we have a highly qualified, we've heard a lot about the frontline the courageous work of our doctors and medical pra uh, practitioners and nurses. So we're proud to introduce Dr. Angela Couples, uh, who is a registered nurse of uh, outstanding merit and accomplishment and joining us. And now that we have Dr. Ford and a registered nurse, I feel as well as Dr. Ross and Dr. Carroll, we are fully, fully, fully prepared to face this medical emergency that we face. So if you will, let's a round of applause for our three new task force members. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now I ask uh, Dr. Sandra Ford. <laughs> uh, 
an amazing lady. Now, I talked to Dr. Ford two or three times a week. We commiserated early and late. And uh, this lady is an amazing, she's the energizer bunny of the Cal County. Uh, she served as our district health director, doing a phenomenal job, and also as interim district health director in, in Fulton County, Georgia, the two counties with the highest incidences of uh, COVID infection. Uh, Dr. Ford has done a great job. So I want to ask Dr. Ford if she'll give us uh, our task for us a brief update uh, as it relates to the Cap County, Georgia, in terms of where we are and maybe even some next steps. Thank you, Mr. CEO, and thank you for your kind words um, at your earlier press conference this morning. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I'm currently doing both uh, Fulton and DeKalb County, but my time at Fulton will be ending next week. I will, effective May 1st, return full-time to DeKalb County. Very much looking forward to providing you all with my undivided attention. Um, meanwhile, um, my team has done an extraordinary job of holding down the fort as I run up and down 85 several days a week, and so um, I'm sure they'll be happy to have me back full-time as well. So let me give you a snapshot of what's currently going on first in the state and then specifically in DeKalb County. So the state is now up to 21,512 cases as of noon today, 4,000 of nine of which are hospitalized, 872 deaths. 62% um, of those cases, um, cases, mind you, are less than 60, 34 are greater than 60. However, when you look at the death rate, the death rate is predominantly of 60 and over, the, the vast majority. Now in DeKalb, we currently have um, 1,639 cases, which makes us number two in the county for cases. Death, we have 33 deaths, which makes us number five for deaths. We are, however, a very distant second to Fulton County, so they have 2,300 compared to our 16. 1,586 deaths compared to our 33. So we are still number one and number two for prevalence, but we are uh, number two and number five for deaths. Um, in terms of racial breakdown, again, we are still having um, challenges collecting historic uh, racial data, but moving forward from last week, we have managed to collect um, some data. And so um, first I'll start with the state. So of the 21,512 cases, um, of those who actually had data of racial um, background recorded, there were um, 6,743 who identified as black and 5,070 who identified as white. That includes um, black Hispanic and white Hispanic. If you take Hispanic out and those who simply identified as African-American, you have 6632 to 4505. So there's almost a, uh, actually over 2000 more African-American cases of COVID-19 uh, test positive in the state. That does not mean total number of cases because as we know, the majority of folks um, have not been tested and this is based only on those who have received positive test results. Um, in DeKalb County, we have of our 1607 uh, that was recorded as of yesterday, uh, that was our grand total. Of those 1607, 939 did not have racial data attached because as I mentioned, we just started collecting that um, consistently as of last week. However, of those that did have data um, identified as to race, it's a three to one, it's 432 blacks to 145 whites, um, which means that 58% of the cases in DeKalb County do not have a racial identification noted, but of the, of the rest of the other 42, 27% are black and 9% are white. So we're talking about a three to one representation. Um, we have been able to collect uh, as of the, earlier this week, zip code level data, which has also been very telling. Um, I just shared that this morning uh, with the Board of Commissioners and my board as well as the CEO's office. Um, we will be providing that data to um, all interested parties every Tuesday and Thursday. So as of today, our prominent zip codes are 300, and, and this is in ranking order, 30084 is number one in the county. 30058, number two, 
30083 is number 330034, number 4, 30038, number 5, and 30032, number 6. Those are the top six zip codes for prevalence of COVID-19 in the county. Those all cases are uh, over 100, uh, with the exception of 30032, which has 98 cases. Um, the data that I shared with you all um, today that was emailed to you does not include all zip codes because zip codes that had cases of less than five individuals were not included in protection of the privacy of those individuals. There were about 15 zip codes that had a single case, and so they were not included in the count. So that's why when you look at the numbers, they won't add up specifically. So. What are we doing currently? Um, we are, um, as you know, the governor sent out an order um, last week before the um, release of the um, businesses. It was an order sent out to expand um, testing criteria. Uh, initially, we had a shortage of tests statewide, and so we had to have very restrictive criteria um, that was prioritized based on physician referral and status as a first responder. Since that point, we have been able to expand testing criteria to include all symptomatic individuals. And so there's no longer a need for referrals, which I think will help some of the inequities that we are seeing in um, some of our racial data because there's no longer a need to have to be referred by a physician. So that takes care of a lot of uh, disenfranchised folks who may not have access to a primary care physician and certainly not during these times. So anyone who is symptomatic can report their symptoms on our call line, which is 404-294-3700, option one. When they give that information, they will then be scheduled for an appointment. We have two locations in DeKalb County currently. We have a location in South DeKalb near Boulder Crest Road, and we have a location in North DeKalb in Dunwoody. Um, we have plenty of tests available, and we are scheduling folks as, as frequently as our tests allow. So if you call those numbers, we will be able to schedule you with an appointment, and you will receive your results anywhere between 24 to 48 hours. Um, in terms of contact investigation, we are starting to ramp that up because that is the next stage of addressing COVID-19 is to really figure out who has been exposed, who is symptomatic, and identify some of your potentially asymptomatic individuals as well. And so we'll be reaching out um, to our teams that we are putting together with assistance not only from Emory School of Public Health, but I just got an email this afternoon that Georgia State was also um, offering us assistance with contract tracing. Contract contact tracing. Um, this is an extremely labor intensive process because um, a single individual can have, you know, 40 or 50 contacts. And so it is incumbent upon us to make sure that we have enough manpower to do this in an appropriate way. I'm also evaluating a, a couple of proposals that have been shared with me um, of, regarding software that can do some of this as well. Um, software that can assist not only with contact tracing, but uh, assist us with scheduling our um, testing site um, so that individuals can register online and then be given a time. They can also obtain their results online, which would also free up a lot of staff to, to do more of the contact and uh, tracing piece of it. Um, we learned yesterday that the National Guard is also um, putting up a test site. That is through um, the state, and they are assisting as well with um, outbreak investigations. We have um, at last count 18 long-term care facilities in DeKalb County that have experienced a COVID outbreaks with numbers anywhere between one to two per center to up to 30s and 40s. And so uh, I have been most aggressive in trying to address those issues because clearly that is our most vulnerable population. And um, they are locked in. And so it has to be coming from folks inside and out, which would be the staff. So we have been trying to uh, educate staff and management at these facilities on appropriate um, protective measures, including sanitizing all surfaces. Um, we have been working with the state to provide them with protective personal equipment if they don't have any. 
Um, but it's not just a matter of providing it. They need to be diligent in using it. One of the things we've been sharing is that, um, honestly, the types of individuals that work in those types of facilities are folks that like to love up on seniors. And so changing the paradigm shift from, no, you can't come do hair, you can't come, you know, sit with them or read to them or do their nails is a big, is a big shift in operations for a lot of these facilities. And so they're having to go from being a very warm, friendly, touchy-feely environment to essentially operating as if they were in a surgical suite. And that's a big educational shift for folks to understand that you need to switch your gloves out every time you move from one bed to another. And so we're just trying to educate them on ways that they can maintain the safety, not only of their staff, but of the clients. Because a lot of staff are being impacted by COVID-19 as well, which is impacting their, these facilities um, ability to deliver care to their patients. So these are the things that we're trying to manage. Um, I had a was happy to um, participate in a, a silent <laughs> press conference with Sheriff Maddox earlier this week. Um, just wanted to publicly compliment her on the amazing job she has done in uh, maintaining extremely low levels of COVID-19 at the DeKalb County Jail. Um, based on a 1,200 population to have such a small number of both staff and inmates impacted means that they are being extremely diligent about isolating individuals who are presenting with symptoms and those who have been exposed to them, and also monitoring um, positive cases, both among uh, the inmates and staff. So um, I will stop there um, at this point and uh, open the floor up for questions, but those are the main things that we're doing. Um, looking forward to being back into CAP and providing you with data more um, frequently as we gather it and working on some um, large scale interventions. One of the things I was excited to hear on the CEO's presentation was about this potential funding because these disparity and inequity issues in the county are not new, as we all know. And I think that this particular pandemic has simply highlighted something that's been an issue, um, not only in DeKalb County, but throughout the nation. And so this unfortunate series of events gives us an, an opportunity to really address this on a, a broader level, because uh, truly this is, is an access issue, it's a resource issue, and um, now's the time to take advantage of the support that we've been receiving from so many different sources to try to address this once and for all. And so we were joking about making uh, lemonade out of lemons, but I think what we really wanna do is uh, create a lemon grove and that way we don't have to worry about lemonade ever again. Any questions? <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, that question for Dr. Ford. Uh, Dr. Ford, this is Lamar Smith, Defects Director. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Uh, can you give me the top three zip codes again, please? I, this is particularly valuable for me as my workers are, are still out responding to cases. Certainly, and if you want to send me your email, I can include you on that. What we're going to do, this is New Day. We just started doing this Tuesday. So I'm going to ask my public information officer, Eric Nickens, to create a list, serve of people who are interested in this information. Um, we, we mapped out the last set um, that we got on Tuesday, but we'll, we haven't mapped this one out yet because it's very striking when you see it visualized on the map. But the top three are 30084, 58, and 83. Those are your top three. You're welcome. Right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ross? Yeah, Dr. Ford, uh, I saw the paper, I think it was today or maybe yesterday, that Dr. Toomey announced there would be a number of contact tracers hired for the state. Uh, do you, Can you tell us more about that? And, and if so, how many are coming to DeKalb County? Well, there are 25 epidemiologists um, assigned to the state. Um, that's not, you know, we've got 18 public health districts. So their um, oversight will be on a general level and more or less training of our teams. We're putting together teams internally. Um, we were utilizing, this is part of the challenge right now, is um, some of the members of the teams that we had put together were um, part of our environmental health team. And now that um, restaurant bans will be lifted on Monday, they will need to return to their usual work of restaurant inspections. And so, um, that's why we are very interested in looking at schools of public health 
um, that are in our neighborhood to assist us with this process. But I'm also very curious about evaluating the software, which sounds like it might be also be a great solution for us. That's great. Yeah. I do, uh, one one follow up then uh, when you mentioned uh, the schools, you've got both uh, Georgia State with a uh, public health undergraduate degree, also Agnes Scott. Um, have you reached out to them or? I have reached out to Agnes Scott and actually she uh, offered to send students to assist us with the process. So um, yes, we've 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 been in contact with her from the onset of this. She's always been a great partner. Right. Thank you, Judge Jackson. Yes. Judge Jackson. Yes, thank you, Mr. CEO. Dr. Ford, this is Judge Asha Jackson um, from the DeKalb Superior Court. I was I the camera shot like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you could see what I look like behind it, then. You can... <laughs> I didn't have to do that. I was like, wow, that's lovely. <laughs> She's looking good. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for all of your hard work. I was wondering if you could just give us a brief update about sort of where we are in terms of quote unquote flattening the curve as we start to think about and plan for returning to work kinds of issues. We're getting all kind of data, but I just wondered if you could kind of give us an update in terms of a timeline uh, as to kind of where you project that we are you know, from, from all of the information you've received. Yeah, I've been listening to these, you know, I, I call them crystal ball folks because um, we're still on an upward trend. So I don't know that I can with any real accuracy tell you when we will start to flatten out. I will say that the number of cases every day has decreased, but it's not a, it's not a, a dramatic enough decrease where I could say, oh, this is, you know, we're heading in, we're heading in that direction. But in terms of a time frame, that's a tough, that's a tough call. We're still getting, you know, almost a thousand new cases a day um, at the state level. And so um, we are still very much on an upward climb. Um, it remains to be seen what happens with the relaxing of the um, restrictions and whether or not people continue to practice um, the appropriate protections, whether they're inside or outside. The other piece of that, though, as I have mentioned in a couple of other um, settings, once you start testing more widely, you will have more positives. And so if anything, I would expect in the next two weeks, the numbers to increase rapidly. In fact, my prediction was probably by the end of next week, we'll probably see more like 30,000 cases in the state, um, simply because we have more capacity, A, more capacity to test, and the tests that we are receiving are, we're getting results faster. And so those things are gonna um, be dramatic you know, demonstrations of, if anything, increases in the number of cases. Thank you. One last question for Dr. Ford, and we'll circle back because she's a part of the next uh, presentation as well, but Ms. Levitan? Well, I wanted to thank you, um, CEO Thurman, for your leadership in this. Um, I have just gotten off a call, um, another call like this. Isn't it amazing what you can do for me with your computer today? Isn't it just <laughs> anyway, the, the National Civic League, which is the oldest good government group. Um, I'm on still on their board of advisors, uh, which consists of um, city managers, uh, people involved from all over the country. Uh, I was with uh, California. Anyway, of course, this came up, you know, the, what people are doing. And I pointed out to them what we are doing in DeKalb County. Um, it's an interesting thing that they're getting ready to um, talk about the All-America City. And they usually have a theme. And I thought the word that they used uh, was so interesting um, to talk about it, and I think DeKalb County really and tr truly ex uh, exemplifies this, not only, you know, with um, the work that you're doing, Dr. Ford, I think it's just absolutely amazing. And by the way, the map that you talked about, someone sent me that, and I think everybody here should see that because they can check every um, zip code and see how many, I, I, you, you've done a great job with that. But resiliency is the word that I heard today. And I think that that's one of the things that we can really incorporate in the work that you're doing um, 
CEO Thurman because DeKalb County is a resilient um, group of people that really and truly care about it. But one of the things that came up and I noticed after I called, um, I had TV on for a minute and I understand that Mr. Bloomberg is, is assisting New York with doing that. They are talking about um, participating and training for tracing. I mean, this was a new thing for me, but evidently it's something that has just come up where they are tracking, I call it tracking, what's going on. And it just occurred to me because they said that he was contributing three and a half million dollars for this, that he might be a good one to come south and see what we're doing here in DeKalb County. And um, commend you for the great job that you've done. And I think we really need to get out to the general public um, the, the testing situation, because I mean, it's amazing to me that you can get this done in so many different places that I was not aware of. I, I don't know if the other members of the, um, that are here today um, were aware of how many places you can get these tests done. And um, my daughter had the virus in Philadelphia. And luckily it was a, a light case, but it took her eight days to get the results. And she was already better by the time she got the results. So um, I think, and I hate to use the word publicizing, but that's what it is. I think we need to be in the forefront of what DeKalb County is doing especially with the diversity that you pointed out and um, letting people know what we're doing here in DeKalb County um, for the safety and health and future because from what I'm reading that there might be another outbreak and that people can get the virus again, the infection. So, I mean, really actually what I'm saying is thank you for what you're doing here, every one of you on this committee, and I'm familiar with all of the great work that most of you are doing. <laughs> so I wanna thank you for allowing me as a member of ARC, and that's actually what I spoke to the chairman. Um, we're talking about seniors, which includes me, um, but just take district two, um, Mr. Raid, uh, Commissioner Raider's district, um, District 2, 45% of its population are seniors. And um, that is the most vulnerable group. So I think something special needs to be done to make these individuals aware of what they need to be doing and what they need to be looking out for, but also where they can get help. So I've made my statement. And again, thank you, thank you, Mr. Thurman. No, See, thank, uh, you, uh, I, thank you. Thank you. My, my friend Michael, how about that? How about that's it? Thank you, Ms. Levitan. Madam CEO, thank you. Dr. Ford, any response? Well, that's a blessing, ma'am, because you know, a lot of folks have had a very torturous course with this disease, so that's a blessing that she's fully recovered. Um, and that's some, some of the other pieces that we're looking at now, um, are taking the plasma of individuals who have recovered and providing that to um, currently infected individuals. And so far it has proven to have some, some positive effects. In fact, I have a dear friend as we speak receiving plasma from a recovered individual uh, here in Georgia. And so fingers crossed on that. Thank you so much, Dr. Ford. Uh, we'll pause now because I noticed that uh, presiding officer Bradshaw is uh, on the line. I know we had uh, several committee meetings. Uh, Commissioner Bradshaw, uh, any uh, welcoming words on your behalf? And then we'll call the roll uh, after we hear from the presiding officer. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Presiding Officer. Thank uh, everyone for participating in uh, lending your expertise to this process. Uh, once again, I'll underscore my thanks to the CEO for uh, your outstanding leadership during this extremely challenging time. And all I'll do is simply underscore that uh, you have the support of the BOC in this endeavor and that we are united as a governing authority. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And I'll ask uh, Ms. Dolores Coyle to call the roll, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. CEO. 
Uh, we'll start out with uh, Dr. Sandra Ford, Dr. Patrick <laughs> O'Connor. <laughs> oh, and she is, she is showing her glamour right, shots. Everybody break out the right. glamour shots, right? I'll be right back. What's going on? That was great. That's great. That may be a new requirement, sir. You want to make for the test? The problem is this is my glamour shot. <laughs> Do I go out and get my high school picture? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever your pleasure, madam. <laughs> okay, so we had Dr. Ford, uh, Dr. Patrick O'Connell, Dr. David Ross, here. Dr. Anaga Couples, here. Our new one of our new members, our presiding officer Steve Bradshaw, here. Um, Commissioner Lorraine Cochran Johnson. Former CEO Leanne Levitin, Commission, Commissioner yeah. Jeff Rader, yeah. uh, Interim Superintendent Ramona Tyson, uh, Chief Judge Asha Jackson, I'm here, uh, Chief Joseph Cox, uh, Director Jack Lumpkin, here, uh, Sheriff Melody Maddox, along with her glamour shot. Here, uh, uh, House Chairwoman Carla Drenner, Senate Chairwoman Emmanuel Jones, uh, Mayor John Ernst from Brookhaven, Mayor Melody Hammett, uh, Chair of the DeKalb Municipal Association from Pine Lake. I'm um, here. Okay, Perimeter CID Ann Hanlon, she is en route. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, the well renowned Emery Morseberger. <laughs> incredible, 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 yes. Uh, Brookhaven Chamber President Alan Goodman, uh, Interim President Ken Coleman for DeKalb Chamber. Here and hoping to be world renowned one day, like Emery. Yeah. <laughs> And here, another up-and-coming world-renowned uh, Dorian DeBar from the DeKalb Development Authority. Present. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, Lamar Smith from DFAX. I'm uh, here. Uh, Jeff Parker from MARTA. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parker. And uh, our, our two uh, additional new members, Ms. Jeannie Lynn. I'm and here. Samia Abdullah. I'm here. Thank you. And there's your role, Mr. CEO. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, welcome once again. And before I proceed, I would just like to recognize and thank CEO Parker. I, I followed the media uh, over the last few days and the challenges that are being faced uh, at MARTA and the steps that you've taken. Uh, Mr. Parker, we really appreciate uh, your sensitivity and your focus and the challenges that you're facing. And I just want you to know that you have our support. Appreciate it. And uh, I will just pass on. I know I have your support because when we needed some masks and we were in a pinch, it was uh, you and uh, your team from DeKalb County that stepped up and filled a hole that we had for our employees. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Your employees are our employees. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, now I would like to call on two of our uh, members here, uh, Dr. Patrick O'Carroll and Dr. David Ross. Uh, Dr. Ross has been a person who I relied upon uh, to provide to counsel and uh, support and direction as we attempted, as we are really the ongoing effort to maneuver through this crisis. And uh, we've heard a lot about modeling and flattening the curve and and so many terms that I'm not uh, familiar with and the predictability of these models and the reliability of the model. And these models are being used and as they should to help people like myself uh, develop and implement public policy. So we've asked uh, Dr. O'Carroll and Dr. Ross, assisted by Dr. Ford, if they might uh, share with us uh, some ground level understanding of COVID-19 model, modeling and data statistics, what do they really mean? Uh, you hear the terms, but oftentimes it's spoken and re-spoken in the media, but with not a lot 
a tremendous amount of definition and understanding. So I would like to call and ask uh, Dr. Ross and Dr. Carol and Dr. Ford if they might provide us with some insight and understanding so we will be better prepared uh, to make decisions going forward for the Cab County State of Georgia. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. CEO, um, for asking that we, we talk about this. I know these are words that everyone hears and to a greater or lesser extent, people sort of understand what they mean. I think Dr. Ford used the correct expression, the crystal ball folks. Um, that's really what we're talking about. Uh, but before I say that, I just wanna again, thank you, Mr. CEO, for the really great leadership job you are doing and all the, the, the county staff. I, I, you all are working so hard and so well. Um, as a citizen of DeKalb County, I just, really appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> and actually, I think the data, the facts, actually show that there's some relationship to uh, the, that strong, aggressive leadership and the impact it's had on making people uh, safe. I also want to thank, as others have, Dr. Ford. Um, she, is, uh, she is the whirling dervish. She is really uh, a bundle of energy and and has done so much for the county and for actually for the state and I and Sandra I want to thank you just personally for having done double duty for over a year uh, handling both the uh, DeKalb and Fulton districts that's a huge task um, I'm uh, I'm honored to know you so uh, with that let me say a few words then about about forecasting and why it's so critical it's critical because uh, we need to inform decision making, but underscore the word inform. Inform doesn't mean that the models make the decisions, but they offer our decision makers um, an opportunity to ask more probing questions. These models can help identify hotspots. Um, they can help identify trends in the spread of, of COVID throughout the county and the state and across the country. And they can therefore help us decide where to focus resources like ventilators or thinking ahead for emergency overflow beds or a staffing material supplies, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> but let's, let's be clear that forecasts use statistical or mathematical algorithms. So understanding a model Basically, if you really want to dig into it, requires that you understand the assumptions that are made in assembling that equation or set of equations, that mathematical model, uh, and, and that you understand the specific parameters in that model and how you can tweak them to get to different results. So therefore, under a sort of opening up the hood to the engine uh, is, is part of what our, our uh, leaders like our CEO and our and our health officer have to do to try to understand a bit more about what whether or not uh, you can make something out of what the model is projecting or as, as Dr. Ford referred to him as the crystal ball. So um, in a conversation yesterday with with the CEO uh, Dr. Carroll and I were talking and Patrick referred to weather modeling as a good example weather modeling is more precise the closer to the day it comes. So like, it's pretty easy to tell the weather today, just open up the window and look out, you can see it. Uh, <laughs> what's it gonna be tomorrow? Well, looking at the weather today gives you a pretty good guess about tomorrow, but the weather forecasters are looking at actual uh, physical representations of air flows and the uh, currents moving across the country and temperatures at different elevations. And they put that together in a mathematical way uh, to make a prediction. And that prediction also uses data from the past that looked a lot like these values today to predict what tomorrow is. So the closer you are to the time you're predicting, the more likely it is going to be close to right. The farther out, the more uncertainty there is. And that's the same with all of these COVID models. So uh, I would say that you will hear and, and often said uh, references to different models. There's basically four big ones that are being used. 
the ones from Columbia University, the ones from the University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, or IHME, that's the most often one-sided. Los, Los Alamos National Lab has one, and Northeastern University uses a modeling of biological and statistical systems uh, to predict things. So that's, you're gonna hear these, these models, you might hear IHME, sometimes you may not even know the citation for whose model they're referring to. But each of these models uses different technologies, different sets of equations. <laughs> and, um, and yet, so it's like multiple cars lined up, each has a different kind of motor under the hood. They will drive you down the road. So we are um, at a point now where we're looking ahead. So let's take a look at um, one model uh, that I think, do we have any graphics to show? I know we- Hi everybody, this is, this is Ann Hamlin with the Perimeter CID. I'm sorry I'm joining late. I just wanted to announce myself. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Hamlin. Ah, okay. So the uh, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at University of Washington has produced predictions for every state on when the maximum number of COVID deaths and cases will crest and then start to decline. And based on those predictions, they came up with this map that speaks to relaxing social distancing and other containment strategies, and uh, including testing and contact tracing that Dr. Ford talked about, and isolating patients who test positive, and, and strategies like limiting gathering size, and produce this map for the country. And you'll notice what Georgia is colored at. It's colored at uh, a prediction by this model based on data as we have them today, factoring in some uncertainty, that we really should not relax our uh, social distancing and, and uh, containment strategies until well into June. Now that's a model prediction and it's looking out a month and a half, so there's a zone of uncertainty here. Uh, but I think that tells us that that model predicts a flattening of the curve, as they say. So what does that mean? It means that the uh, rate of new cases is leveling off and ultimately declining. So once that stays constant for a while and then the number of cases per day starts to reduce and the number of deaths per day starts to reduce and continues to reduce for a several week period. Now think about that. The CDC definition is, is predicated on the notion that it would be two weeks of straight, steady, or decline before you could say, okay, we've crested the worst and we are on a steady downtick uh, down to very low case day rates and, and deaths. Based on that modeling, you see that this model says Georgia should not start to loosen up until June or mid-June. So that's this, we, we put this up really to say, the model now allows us to ask the more probing question. And this is really the challenge that Dr. Ford has and, and CEO Thurman and the commissioners and all of you that are in these social policy judgment positions. You now have to take this kind of prediction and say, what do we do? So I, I thought maybe at this point, hand it over to Patrick and let you, Dr. O'Carroll, I'll let you talk a bit what you think about this means in terms of actions that we should take. And then uh, to Dr. Ford, who's I think probably uh, way ahead of us <laughs> in thinking about what she has to do. Patrick? Sure, thank you, Dave. Um, so as Dave indicated, these models looking out six weeks are not nearly as accurate as they are looking out six days, any more than our weather forecasters are. Um, and I mentioned the word number six because um, according to the latest models from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, it looks like six days from now, 
Georgia may reach its peak in terms of, of deaths per day after which it should then start to gradually decline and then decline more quickly. And that makes the assumption that we continue to do what we're doing, um, you know, restrict mass gatherings, stay home, you know, self-isolate, identify when we're sick and be contained and all that sorts of things, all the things we're doing now. If we continue to do that well, and by the way, people in DeKalb appear to be doing it quite well, um, then we may reach the peak in six days. Now, according to the national plan, as Dave referenced it, the national plan says that um, 14 days of steady decline, after 14 days of steady decline in deaths and other indicators, uh, new cases, um, you could start thinking about uh, relaxing. So there's there's a that, that takes us out only about three weeks from now. So there's a big difference between three weeks from now and mid June, but somewhere in that period, certainly no sooner than three weeks from now, but more likely into June. Um, we will start saying we have now we are now in the position where we're going to move away from everyone having to sort of stay at their homes as best they can to keep this thing from growing. And we're going to move into getting back to normal, but into what they call a really rich containment strategy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, a containment strategy, I've been talking about it as having three parts, but last night I heard the former CDC director, Tom Frieden, talk about four sides of a box. It was really kind of creative to box in COVID and keep this virus from getting out of the box. And the four sides of the box are as follows. And this is effectively the containment strategy that has to be ready to go when we in DeKalb, certainly and in Georgia in general, say, we don't have to worry so much about staying home all the time. What we got to do is, is contain any new cases. As so the containment strategy involves testing rapidly anyone who develops symptoms that might be consistent. I was really uh, encouraged by Dr. Ford's description of the amplification of testing capacity in Georgia. That's just, in Atlanta in particular, that's just wonderful. So that's one side of the box. We have to be ready to test everyone who gets symptoms that suggest they might be sick. We have to be able to isolate, this is the second side of the box. Anyone who's positive has to be quickly isolated so they don't spread the disease any further. And then they have to be taken care of, of course, if they're symptomatic and, and taken to the hospital and so forth. It's just as important though, just once we've identified that person who's positive and they're sick, we now need to do contact tracing. And that's what you heard about. And there's nothing magical about that. It's exactly what it sounds like. If, if I turned out to be positive, uh, investigators from the health department are gonna call me and say, tell me who you had contact with since you first had symptoms. And in fact, since a couple of days before you had symptoms, when it may be that I was infectious. Now, most of us, if we got sick for two days and then got sick enough that we thought it might be COVID and got, finally got tested, they might be asking me about contacts five days ago. That's pretty hard for me to remember, but maybe not so much if we've been staying inside most of the time, because maybe then we could say, well, I, I went to Chick-fil-A in my car and I got a you know, drive through and I went to McDonald's once and I went to the supermarket once. And then, and then, you gotta, then the health department has to reach those contacts, reach out to them, and find out how much contact was there really. Was it intense enough that we need to worry about them? And if the answer is yes, like yes, we had we sat together and had a glass of wine, and I, you know, I remember being within six feet for quite some time. Now we need to put that person into quarantine. And that's the fourth side of the box. So the four sides are testing, isolating positives, tracing their contacts, and quarantining those who've been exposed to them who may never get sick, but who may have been infected. We won't know until they develop symptoms or don't develop symptoms. So that's a big task. That's, that's the bad news. The good news is we have some weeks to try to get this plan and this uh, group of people, that is the people who do contact tracing, the people who will do the testing, um, the people who will manage the isolation and make sure that that happens well, and the people who will supervise the quarantines. I know that Dr. Ford already knows how to do this because public health people do this all the time for very small outbreaks. So this is not new to COVID. What's new is the scale, the enormous scale that we're dealing with. I mean, I've seen estimates that suggest uh, Atlanta may need 1,600 people, 1,600 contact tracers, according to the Johns Hopkins University and the basic calculations they're doing per population. Now, we don't expect 1,600 employees a good number of those may be volunteers. And in addition, as Dr. Ford pointed out, it may be with these days with everybody carrying around cell phones that instead of relying on my memory as to who my contacts were, who I maybe exposed, 
we may be able to use cell phone technology to know who I got near to, and it may be a much more simple than it used to be to effectively find uh, do contact tracing. So um, that is the challenge. Between now, when you're hearing my voice, when we are not ready yet to release, uh, in my opinion, to, to uh, and in the opinion of the modelers who have looked at this, um, to actually relax our um, social distancing. But when the time comes that it is time to relax social distancing, we have to have this containment strategy in place. The people, the technology, the materials, and the plan. Um, we have got to have that in place. And so the clock is ticking on getting that set of resources mm -hmm. together so that when we get to the point of relaxing social distancing, we are we really have a robust containment strategy ready to ready to rock. So why don't we stop there and, and take questions? As, as we take questions, I will also say I think one concern that we should that you as leaders should be aware of is it, it concerns me that with the models being presented, people may see that downhill curve and say, oh boy, it's over. <laughs> That's not the case at all. And as, as Dr. O'Carroll was saying, we have a lot to do. Uh, and so I think the messaging, public messaging here is going to be critical, is that we may have crested the, the, the top of the hill. We are a long way from being able to open back up. And there are a lot of ramifications for that, but that really needs to be all of us in our communications with friends, family, business associates, or the public at large, a message. So Thank you for saying that, Dave. I, I, and let me, if I could um, back up Dr. Ross on that one. If you look at that graph that's showing with the dotted line that's heading downhill, you can, it is a natural thing to look at that dotted line halfway down and think, look, we're, we're doing fine. Let's, uh, let's socially distance at this point. I mean, let's take that off the social distancing at this point. If you go out to May 15th, that's still over 50 deaths per day in Georgia. Those are, it's, we got to put, put that into, so those are 50 human lives. Those are 50 brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and grandparents and children, some of them. 50 a day that don't need to die. And that's if we do this right. That's if we don't jump the gun and take off the social distancing too fast. So the fact that it's halfway down that scale doesn't mean we're done. It means we still are in deep water. We got to make sure that we get that thing going all the way down as best we can. And that when we start to release the pressure on this virus and the pressure we're applying is through the social distancing, we're ready with that containment strategy. All right, are there questions for Dr. Ross and Dr. O'Carroll? This is Sami Abdul. I have a I have a question with the CEO. Yes, please. Yes, um, my question is about the testing and um, in that box of containing the uh, COVID nineteen in communities where access to testing is very limited because of transportation, and particularly to communities that are new Americans um, in. So basically, when we have North Decap or South Decap, and we have another location which is Dunwoody, one of the things that the free uh, clinics in uh, Clarkson area started doing is testing, COVID-19 testing. Um, our clinic is actually doing one on starting from May 2nd for the next three months. The reason being because when you have communities that are workers and live in a very close uh, apartment unit, um, the isolation of community member that is COVID positive mm -hmm. is very difficult within their little two small apartment building where or home where there's about six or seven members living there. So one of the things is how do we um, bring those uh, testings closer to sites or sites where maybe looking at creative ways of bringing the testing. And I think this is what the free uh, clinics and our clinic, the Clarkson Community Health Clinic is one of them, is trying to really be proactive in figuring out how we can be ahead of the curve and make sure that we provide linguistic training to communities as far as uh, things in their own languages, as far as um, staying healthy and being isolated, washing their hands and all the other things. So my question is, um, is 
Thank you. Okay, answer that question. You, you're asking if there's testing coming to the Clarkson community specifically? Um, collaboration with, we already have several uh, clinics that are already doing that. Um, so collaboration to be able to use the existing resources within the community, um, which to be able to ramp up more testing, but also assist in the areas of linguistics and contact tracing and all these things, it's just that kind of collaboration. Yes, absolutely. That's why we, you know, I think the state has been pushing for a centralized um, scheduling and, you know, data collection. And what we are trying to explain to them is that the cab is so unique with our language needs that, you know, even if you think you have our language, you probably don't. And so we are trying to keep as much of that process in house because of you know, the unique communities we serve. And so, yeah, we would definitely be looking for partnerships, particularly as we begin contract tracing, because that is one of my concerns is do we have capacity to reach out to those communities that are not English speaking in DeKalb? So Dr. Ford, Ms. Abdul reach out, can she reach out to you or someone on your staff? Uh, she's very active with the uh, with the clinics there we're in the all right, thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Thank you. May I ask a question, please? Yes. Hi. Uh, this is Al Wong. I'm a state court judge in DeKalb. Uh, our judicial emergency state stay is going to expire on May the 13th. I think. Uh, everybody agrees we're not in the position to do any jury trials at this point. But once after the 13th, the courthouse, it's going to, I assume, be back uh, open for business. And we have all sorts of calendars, especially in state court and out on Memorial Drive, uh, the traffic court, with a large number of people coming in on these calendars. Um, and I'm concerned that we, we want to comply with containment strategies. And I wonder if there is any coordinated effort with the sheriff. I know the sheriff is here and she's working really hard. I know she's done a great job at the jail. But in early June, for example, we have even a small arraignment calendar for me. I've got about 60 people reporting. So we got to stagger them. We got to bring them in one at a time and so on and so forth. But you know, the containment strategy about uh, mask and sanitizing equipment, um, testing, all of these things. Is there a recommendation, Dr. Ford, Mr. O'Carroll, Dr. O'Carroll, Mr. Ross, about how we should go about doing this? Because the last thing I think we want is to bring a bunch of citizens in uh, on, le on legal business, and then, then you got a big mass of contamination possibilities. You are absolutely correct, um, uh, Judge, that, that that's our, one of our big concerns is once, how, how are we going to resume business? I don't think there's any argument that at some point we're going to have to get back to some level of normalcy, but I don't think we're ever going to be doing business the way we've been doing business. One of the things that has um, educated us about this process, about this pandemic is how much of our work doesn't need to be done in an office, as is evidenced by this current uh, setup we have right here. And so it has been remarkable to me personally, just from the health department's perspective, how much we've been able to get done outside of our own physical structure. So even once we resume operations um, and have necessity, as you said, for juries and things along that line, we're still going to have to dramatically decrease the number of people that are around us all the time. And if that means spacing wider within the, the jury pool or, you know, keeping people farther apart, we may still have to be offering masks for quite some time. And so that's why we have to continue to replenish the supplies we have. Um, because I don't think, as, as has been predicted, um, it's not unreasonable to expect another peak um, in the fall. Right. And so, um, you know, we have to continue to operate with some level of, of uh, physical distancing, despite whatever is lifted, at least um, for the time being, because, you know, I think gathering in tremendous numbers, again, puts everyone at risk all over again. 
and this is still a novel virus and there's not enough immunity around. The the devil is always in the detail, as we know. Um, So all these folks show up and let's say there's seven state court judges, 10 superior court judges. I know one of my other colleagues on the same day has a calendar as I do, Raymond, on June the 2nd, I believe. I got 58. I don't know how many he has. My point is all of these people are going to come to the front door of the courthouse mm-hmm. and try to make, make it into the calendar. Even if I stagger them every 10, 15, 20 people every hour or hour and a half, two hours, there's still be going to be a flow of people coming into the building. And then, you know, then we got to worry about this uh, rule of 10 gathering in the courtroom itself. And the only way they're going to be hanging around, it's out in the hallway, which creates yet another problem. So is there some recommendation that we can, um, how we should handle this so we can coordinate our effort among the judges and, and certainly the, uh, the person who's going to have to uh, bear the blunt of the responsibility of the, all the deputies working. So this is Patrick, if I could try to respond. Um, you said the devil is in the details. Um, I, I actually have been impressed that the national plan that's available at whitehouse.gov, if you go to that national plan, it talks about how we can have a phased opening of our country. And uh, it even breaks it down one layer deeper and says by employer or by, by type of person. So there's for individuals, for employers, for special categories of people like the vulnerable, and it gives you advice. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it now. Um, can you have people return to work in phases? Can you continue to encourage telework? Can you close common areas where people are likely to congregate? And you just referred to some of those co- areas in your own areas. Is there any way to do that? Can you minimize non-essential travel and adhere to CDC guidelines regarding isolation following travel? Can you make special accommodations for members of a vulnerable population, which includes, of course, the elderly, but also people who may be immunocompromised or other things. So I'd encourage you to look at it, but I think when you do, it'll it'll help guide your thinking, but it'll still be up to each of us to figure out how to take that general guidance, like keep people this far apart and how to make that work at your courthouse. But I think it also underscores, and if I could say this, I don't know what position you're in, whether you must open on that day, but it, it gives you a good reason to think about whether it makes sense to open up on that day, because the prevalence of COVID will still be quite high. And according to that University of Washington model, you heard from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be backing off from what we're currently doing until at least into June. So um, so you're 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 bucking up against a difficult time when the prevalence is still high. And yet, and, and if you go to that White House plan, it says we don't even begin to back off until we first can show that we've had 14 days of steady decline. And we may have that by then or we may not. So I, I, uh, I sympathize with the position you're in, but I think that, that guidance will at least help us structure our thinking and we'll see how, how close to achieving those goals we can and can achieve in our own particular physical situation. So, so like, uh, uh, the, can you I'm repeat sorry. the, um, Patrick, can you repeat that website, um, the first yeah. one that you mentioned? Um, if you go to white, so it's like the the White House, but it's one word, whitehouse.gov slash, and now this is one word, opening America, O-P-E-N-I-N-G-A-M-R-E-R-I-C-A. Um, that, if, or if you just go to whitehouse.gov, you can easily navigate to the plan. Um, and, and as Thank I say, you. it gives some guidance to, to help us as we think about um, but that's if you can move into phase one. But again, we're not supposed to move into phase one until we've had at least 14 days of steady decline in cases and in deaths. And we have that capacity. This is really important. That capacity I talked about for, for containing any new uh, outbreaks of disease. Thank you. Additional questions? Yeah, I'd like, could I make Mike to make a comment? Okay, Dr. Ross. Yeah, I, I think one of the uh, beauties of this forum that you've created uh, here is that you have all these different elements of what make up DeKalb County. You've got the courts, you've got transportation, you've got schools, et cetera. Dr. Ford has to work across and with all of you, but each of you has to work within your own domain. Like with, with Judge Wong bringing up the courts, 
I, I do think it, to the extent they can get any assistance to develop a specific plan for their area. I know that transportation has worked with you and your staff to work out social distancing for uh, transportation uh, staff and protecting them with masks and sanitizing, et cetera. The same with the courts. These plans need to be created uh, because I think we're going to need them again. Uh, they would be, it's a worthy investment. They're going to be not just shelfware, but something that we can use in the future. Uh, and I think you, you, you've, you're fueling a discussion that a lot of counties around the country could benefit from. Uh, this should not be a random walk into the reopening. It needs to be very thoughtful. Last item on the agenda it really is the uh, early stages of the development of this plan or plans that will need to be developed. Judge Jackson. Thank you, Mr. CEO. I just wanted to respond to uh, the two previous comments that were made and I sent Judge Wong a, a message. Uh, we do have a task force that has been um, put together to discuss the quote unquote reopening of the courthouse. And we will be meeting to address a lot of the concerns that were raised. Um, this discussion is happening at a higher level statewide uh, weekly and it is going to be discussed with all of the stakeholders in the courthouse. Uh, notwithstanding that, we, we are seeking um, some of the public health recommendations um, that may be coming about and are continuing to be developed. And so I would personally appreciate uh, the information being sent to me so that I can share it with all of the stakeholders. But as Chief Judge, of the Superior Court, I guess I am tasked with pulling together all of the levels of court in the county. And so that is what we're doing uh, when we meet early next week is to begin to have um, continuous discussions about reopening, though we've already been meeting uh, to try to keep things afloat. And I've reported off, you know, when we had our first task force meeting that was convened by the CEO about uh, some of the efforts that we put in place and we are continuously developing other efforts so that we don't have to think about what to do when we reopen and how to integrate uh, large numbers of people back into our operations. Uh, thank you. And one thing, uh, and I guess I'll, I'll mention it to you, working with uh, presiding officer Brad Shaw and the board of commissioners, part of what we, our challenge will be in the coming weeks is using care resources that are now flowing into the county to help to address some of the issues that Judge Wong and Judge Jackson might confront as you move into the new normal. So the plan by implication may also bear with it some financial investment. So these are the conversations. The good thing is we're beginning to think about it and hopefully, and I know for a fact, uh, we will take appropriate steps to uh, address it. Are there other questions for our panelists? I have Thank a question, you. Mr. CEO. This is Anaga Couple. Yes. Um, I have Couples. a question for Dr. Yes. Um, I have a question for Dr. O'Carroll and Dr. Ross. Um, I'm not very familiar with contact tracing, but does contract tracing raise up issues with maybe privacy and confidentiality? Um, so I'll take a stab at this, but I'd really want to defer to. Uh, Dr. Ford on this as well, because she knows the local laws better than I do. I think in the long history of public health, which dates back well over a century, there's a recognition that in certain cases, confidentiality has to be breached to protect the whole community. So way back in the old days, the, the most common reason for doing this was um, a uh, what we used to call venereal diseases, we now call sexually transmitted diseases. So if you have someone in your clinic with gonorrhea, it's not enough to treat that person because they've probably given gonorrhea to somebody else and we have to reach out to that person. And so we ask for who did they have sexual, you know, Congress with, and then we call that person on the phone and we say, I'm sorry, I know you were with Mr. So-and-so last night and Mr. So-and-so has a case of gonorrhea and you may have it too. And that may seem horrifying in our current day and age when we think, well, there's privacy. No one can know, you know, who I've had sex with and who's got what disease. But the idea is if there's an epidemic, um, it's a threat to the whole community. 
And so there has been public health laws on the books for really many, many decades saying that in such an epidemic situation, only for the purposes of controlling that epidemic, um, a minimum number of people, the absolute minimum necessary to control disease can learn about what they need to know in order to control it. And that includes people that may have been exposed to disease. But Dr. Ford, I defer to you to, to, to amplify on that. So privacy uh, acts come from, uh, the, people talk about HIPAA all the time, Health Insurance Port Portability and Privacy uh, or Accountability Act. And um, what that does is protect certain, what we call PHI, protected health information from being shared. Um, pandemics uh, kind of overrule all of that, that normally would be considered protected health information. Um, what we would say in the in the sense of a contact investigation is that you were exposed, not Joe Brown exposed you. And so there's still some level of confidentiality in that we would just say that you have some, an individual that you have been around has, has exposed you that would not necessarily identify specifically who that person was. But um, Dr. Carroll is correct in the larger scale of, of the issues, the public health a need to protect overrides personal privacy in those types of instances. But even in spite of that, we would do what we could to protect, protect individual privacy. Um, that is part of the reason why we have um, sort of resisted publicly posting where um, the testing sites are um, because we wanted to protect the privacy of individuals who are coming to receive a test. Um, and so we've been trying to stick to that. Um, the other districts um, not have, have, have advertised it and it's still by appointment only, but I just felt like at this point, we still needed to protect folks because there is still some stigma attached to um, even being suspected of having COVID. And so um, that's why we do contact tracing um, as, as uh, dip, you know, diplomatically as possible, but it's, it's still a, a medical necessity at this point. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you, Mr. CEO. No, thank you so much. We have about 20 minutes left in today's meeting. Uh, obviously, if you have additional questions, you can forward those to Ms. Uh, Dolores Cole. You have her email and other contact information, and we can then direct those questions to uh, not just these panelists, but anyone else who might have a knowledge and expertise so that we can get your questions answered. Uh, before I move back to the agenda, I know Sheriff Maddox is with us, and there has been reporting uh, of, of some uh, outbreaks or at least some infections at the jail. Obviously, it's a contained population. Uh, it was important, I think, what one of the earlier, Dr. O'Carroll or Dr. Ross spoke about the wonderful job she's done in maintaining and addressing those issues. So I would like uh, the sheriff to kind of update us on the current status of affairs as it relates to COVID-19 at the DeKalb County Jail. Thank you, Mr. CEO, and thank you for all that are on this task force. I really appreciate it. Um, and trust me, this has not been a one-woman show over here. It has not been without the assistance of everybody else that is on this call that I've been able to reach out to. And Dr. Ford, thank you so much for coming out for that press conference um, on the other day. But yes, we have had, um, several confirmed cases and it was 10 confirmed for our the 10 confirmed cases, which is from our employee, from the level of our employees. Uh, all of them are fine. It, it, and I want to say the last one came back on yesterday or we may have one more out that should be coming back. And then we also have 13 confirmed cases with our inmates, eight of which are already in custody here and they are in isolation and doing uh, really well. We're still following the CDC guidelines, the guidelines of the Department of uh, Health, of Public Health, as well as our WellPath, our medical team here that we're doing. We're going above and beyond the call as what is needed and what is expected here to contain and make sure that not only from the inmates, but from the officers, because remember they're, they're out and they're coming in every day. So again, they're being tested. We have two entrants, the front and the side. They get the temperature check when they come in, including myself coming into the facility. <coughs> also with the um, officers, when they are in the pods, they are wearing masks, they have gloves, they have other PPE equipment. For those, the inmates that are on the floors, they have the confirmed cases, they have the all over, they wear the N95 mask 
as well as the other equipment. We put out probably at least twice a week about maintaining your um, the health, you know, washing the hands and the sneezing in, in the arm as well as wearing your mask when going about. Every inmate that comes into this agency from the time that they're booked in is given a mask. So they must wear that mask when they're moving about, coming out for their daily little walks in their pods, they must have that mask on. They're given equipment, uh, I'm sorry, given um, cleaning and cleaning equipment in order to clean their pods, which means their particular certain areas where they sleep, they are sprayed with the solution, as well as mopping those areas out and cleaning the shower going in. The job going out. Remember that um, make sure that they have water, make sure, just make sure everything is there. Um, well, and again, that's just really, um, I'm very pleased because it's only one of the population that we had um, with the positive contact. We're still going uh, over the scene, as Judge Jackson said, we're meeting next week. Um, to discuss, you know, at the beginning of the courthouse, what we're going to do because the majority of that, as Joe was saying, that it, it comes upon us and the people to make sure that we maintain the form and make sure that everybody was safe as they enter into their house. So, we're still, my, my concern is not for the inmates. CEOs for the office as well because there is a lot of this going on here. And we now put out we put out to the office so about your daily activities because I understand one thing, you know, it's a difference when the officers bring them, they release them into us and then we're here with them. Um so we have to take they take care of we have lots of call in saying what not getting we have to make sure those concerns are um, it's, it's, it's a daunting task over here, but we're doing it. The officers are doing it, but I've also let them know that they have EAP, that they can reach out if they need some help or someone to talk to. We still have clergy to meet with the inmates as well as clergy for the clergy for the officers. They need to speak to someone as well. So it's a two-way street here for the officers as well as for the inmates, and I have to make sure that all populations of this jail are taken care of, especially the officers, because these officers are working around the clock. I myself even work six days a week. I will be on Saturday. I go into staff time and make sure those meals are prepared properly and make sure they get what they need, but also make sure that they are adhered to the protocol for cleaning and sanitizing. On Saturday morning, we'll have the company that comes in and spray as well. Now, my concern about the court also is that, you know, on the press conference the other day, but for the National Guard, of course, uh, we've had probably about 50, maybe if not more, employees that have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Very muffled. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Yeah, we're breaking up a little bit. Let's come back to the share. Uh, Chair, can you check? Uh, we, we're having some problems with, um, with your stream coming from the jail. But we'll come back to finish your comment. Uh, CEO Parker. Uh, uh, can you update us on current affairs at MARTA? I know there have been some changes yeah. made. Yeah, thanks for uh, for including me. And, I, and, you know, I do want to say the uh, conversation from the public health officials has been extremely informative to me, and, and uh, it, it helps me put uh, frame what we're doing. And, and, I, and I think although we've made a very, very difficult decision that's adversely affecting a lot of our customers. We're, we've made the right decision in terms of keeping, keeping people safe. So um, let, let me give you a little bit of background. So, you know, we, as we were running our bus service, we've had about a 30% decrease in ridership, which is not significant on our bus ridership compared to our rail ridership. Our our rail ridership is down about 70 percent. Um, you know, we had a, a few instances of, uh, of where we saw buses that were overcrowding. We, we implemented several uh, measures to, to ensure social distancing, things like um, signage, uh, encouraging people, you know, not to overcrowd the buses, direction to the uh, bus operators to, to stop boarding 
customers if the buses were were on the verge of becoming overcrowding we actually put it put together a phone number so the customers could call um, we strategically um, placed buses around our service area so that we could have dispatch extra buses if we thought a bus was going to become overcrowded and you know what what really came to us was that um, that we just could not guarantee um, limited um, you know the limiting ridership and, and making sure that we have social distancing on our buses so we've gone to uh, you know we have we have marked our seats um telling people where not to sit so that they uh are spread out properly we uh we're asking uh both the operator and the passengers not to allow anyone to stand and and what that's done to us is it's taken a bus that uh under you know normal conditions and a at a busy time could take more than 40 people to only being able to take about 15 people um in order to have you know proper social distancing techniques. So in order to, to operate our, our service, we just quite frankly need more buses um, on, a, on a route to move the same number of people, uh, more than, you know, in some cases, more than double that. So, um, you know, we have a, we have a limited number of, of bus operators. We have a limited number of buses. So we made a difficult decision um, and decided that we were going to, to, to determine which were our most essential bus routes, looked at um, our busiest bus routes, looked at uh, key locations, hospitals, grocery stores, essential businesses that are out there, and came up with 41 routes uh, that, that we are operating. And what we have done with those 41 routes is that if there were previously scheduled eight buses on that route at a given time, we now have 16 buses um, out there serving serving that that population we began this on monday um it's it's been just extremely successful in terms of social distancing um we virtually have um you know the only the only contacts that we're getting from people um are just letting us know that a bus didn't stop and that uh We've had buses that are right behind and, and haven't had to reroute buses to uh, to serve people. But clearly, what it has done is it has left um, you know 60 of our 100 bus routes not operating. Um, while we're while we are um, you know serving something like 60 65 percent of our customers, we do have a lot of routes and a lot of customers who are um, you know we just we just temporarily ceased operation in order to be safe. We put out um, notices at all those bus stops that we're not serving to make sure that, that we notify them. We, we've gone to great lengths to put signage around our system. And, um, you know, we, 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 we continue to do that. So, so what, we're, what we're doing now is we're just going to continue this fine tuning um, of this uh, 41 routes and, and I think we may have an opportunity to add uh, one or two routes back um, this week, possibly Monday morning, um, as we see that um, where the doubling of bus service on a route um, is in excess of, uh, of what we really need to um, ensure social distancing. So, you know, we're, we're going to continue to do that. I think my, my biggest concern moving forward is, is, is that as the, um, as the region um, becomes more active um, and more and more people are moving around, it will clearly mean that more people will be, um, you know, using our service. Um, when the judge was talking about the, uh, um, you know, the, the providing services at, at the courthouse, what went to my mind is there's, you know, a good number of people who are going to be taking the bus into uh, Decatur center or, or riding the rail system and, and we're going to have more people and we've got to make sure that, that we can operate that system safely. So, you know, we are right now um, in a posture of uh, being committed to us uh, providing service that is safe and sustainable. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been a very difficult decision 
Um, but but with that difficult decision, I think it's a, it's a wise one for the health of, uh, of the region. Um, clearly, you know, as we were talking about tracing of people, the last thing that we, we would okay. want the people who are responsible for tracing individuals to hear, well, I was on a bus five times and there was 40 people on that bus and I have no idea who those people were. What we want to have, what we want to hear is that they were on a bus and they felt comfortable that they were, you know, sufficiently distanced away from all the other passengers and, and hopefully everybody was wearing masks and, and um, there's not a significant concern about contact being created um, on a, on a MARTA vehicle. So, Mr. CEO, that, that's where we are. And, you know, I'll be the first to say it's, it's been a very, very difficult decision. But like I said a moment ago, one that I think is, uh, you know, ultimately going to help us get through this quicker. Um, you know, we, we as an employer have been affected. We have uh, 23 employees who have uh, 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 reported to us that they're positive. We've identified 122 employees who came in contact with those 23 employees, and and uh, over uh, you know a period of time they've been uh, they've been self quarantining and and uh, you know with extremely uh, heavy heart. I you know we did have one employee pass away just a, a couple of days ago, um, so we I'm sure we will continue to be affected by this as we all are, but you know we we are committed to uh, providing safe and uh, sustainable service as we get through this. Thank you so much. Is there You're a welcome. question for Mr. Parker? Uh, Mr. CEO, this is Lamar Smith. I have a question for Mr. Parker. Um, sure. Uh, thanks for the update and I appreciate you uh, considering the community safety. Um, will your process for reopening routes uh, include uh, engaging with uh, the task force here and, and other strategies. Um, I just know I just had a few calls. The Route 125 to our DeKalb uh, office uh, is temporarily closed uh, and, and just wanted to reach out to hear uh, what perhaps some strategies look like uh, for reopening routes. Yeah, um, you know, I would encourage everyone, uh, you can you can email me directly or anyone on our staff. We're, we're going to great lengths to track all of the feedback that we're getting um, about this. I actually have a have a map in front of me of, of all the routes that were not running color coded by the number of people who have called about those individual routes. That's mostly through our our customer service, the the 804-848-5000 uh, number, just so we're, we're trying to track uh, passengers who are, um, uh, you know, uh, concerned about the lack of uh, bus service. Um, and, you know, I, I encourage people to reach out to us so that, that we're hearing where, um, you know, the most um, difficult circumstances exist. And ultimately what we want to do is we want to, as we add service back, we want to make sure that we're providing the biggest benefit to uh, the overall system. Um, so um, please pass anything on you, you have to me. I've, I've noted 125, um, you know, as, as one of the routes that, that you'd mentioned. So I'll pass that on to our team. Thank you. Uh, one other question. We have time for one additional question from Mr. Parker, if there is one. All right. Thank you. We'll go back. I think the sheriff may, I wanted to give the sheriff time to finish her comments. Uh, well, no, they're still working on it at the sheriff's office. So uh, finally, uh, we won't spend a lot of time on it, but obviously this has major ramifications. Uh, sheriff, we'll yeah, back. Yeah, 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 yeah. So one of the key set of decisions that we will have to make going forward is around the reopening of DeKalb County's uh, business community. And one of the things I would like to do is to establish a subcommittee of this task force that will begin to look at the myriad of issues that will be faced by business owners and uh, employers and employees as we return to whatever the new normal will look like. And so with that in mind, I wanted to ask Presiding Officer Bradshaw, uh, Mr. Morrisberger, as well as Mr. Coleman, 
would serve as a nucleus of a committee. And of course, we will recruit other members to begin to shape the plan, a set of principles and guidelines that can help the Cap County business owners, employers make the transition at the appropriate time in an appropriate way that will mitigate the spread of this disease uh, that uh, Mr. Rawls, Dr. Rawls and Dr. Carroll talked about at that point when it's appropriate to do so. So if you all, uh, Mr. Presiding Officer and Mr. Morrisberger and Mr. Coleman will agree to do that, I would appreciate it. Yes, Mr. CEO, I will answer that call. Yes, sir, be honored to do so. And I'll be honored as well, thank you. And thank you, of course, there are other business representatives on the task force, they'll obviously be involved, but we will also recruit other members from the business community to participate in this very important subcommittee. And uh, finally, um, today I issued a um, COVID-19, uh, what we call the 30-day transition plan. It dealt with some of the questions that were raised. Uh, look, there's been a lot of debate and discussion uh, over the governor's decision to reopen uh, some uh, non-essential businesses beginning tomorrow. Well, uh, no matter where you stand on that issue or that decision, I stated publicly what my opinion was, but the bottom line is uh, the governor's made it quite clear, uh, at least at the last communication, that he was not rescinding his decision. So consequently, uh, as leaders in DeKalb County, we now have to go forward and do everything we can to mitigate spread and keep people alive to the greatest extent possible. And in order to do that, uh, we're going to have to work uh, uh, like Trojans uh, over the coming days to help the cab transition in the most uh, safest and the most secure way possible. So that's what this task force, with your support, uh, will be focused on. And that's something I'll be talking to uh, uh, presiding officer Brad showing the commissioners about in the days to come. How do we do it? It's going to happen, uh, whether it happens in June or July or September or next year, it is going to happen. And the professionals have stated very clearly, Dr. Ford and others, these are the steps that need to uh, take place before it occurs. Our job is to make sure that the precautions are in place prior to the, the doors being reopened as much as possible. So that's kind of where we are. The second thing, uh, as stated earlier, that through the uh, CARES Act, the Cap County, along with other uh, metro counties with plus 500,000 population, are uh, receiving uh, funding to support the local response to offset costs and make proper investment. Uh, we need, I would like for this task force to advise the administration uh, when a plan is presented, ultimately the decision uh, with all appropriation rests with the Board of Commissioners. CEO recommends Board of Commissioners decide I'm asking this task force in your various capacities to help create the most integrated, uh, the most thoughtful plan possible for DeKalb County to address the current pandemic, but more importantly, mm -hmm. to invest in prevention so that we can reduce the probability of crises like this reoccurring again. So going forward, uh, it, and Dr. Ford said it, uh, uh, I think uh, most succinctly than I ever will, out of this crisis, we can actually become a stronger, healthier community if we take advantage of it. And if we don't just spend money without a vision, a strategy, and a plan in place. Uh, obviously, uh, Dr. Ross, you know, one of the things that you've helped me focus on is there is a need for research and analysis to help us better understand how did this happen? How is it that Southwest Georgia and even communities of color in DeKalb County have been so disproportionately impacted and not just to have a study to sit on a shelf, but to help guide policymakers, uh, commissioners, legislators, CEOs, how do we put plans and strategies and policies and investments in place that will help people live safer lives? So that's the challenge going forward. And that's the, also the opportunity we have going forward. Let us not allow the people who lost their lives to have died in vain. As, as painful as it is, uh, Mr. Parker spoke of one employee, 
Uh, we've had two DeKalb County employees who lost their lives as a result of COVID-19. We had another young man, uh, just 41 years old, uh, who was very active uh, in DeKalb government on boards and commissions. Uh, he lost his life just this past week. This is life and death. It's not politics anymore to me at all. And I want us as DeKalb County residents to recognize that it has absolutely nothing to do with politics. It's about saving people's lives. So with that, uh, unless there are other critical issues, uh, I want to once again thank our newest uh, task force members. There'll be others joining us as this journey, and it is a journey, uh, continues. And uh, I want to thank all of you once again for volunteering to be with us and uh, just be safe and uh, be secure, but don't grow weary uh, because, you know, we, we, we'll get this job done. Thank you.